But now, let's review the midfield and how they got on in 2021. And we'll go through all the teams and, you know, what position they finished in. And we'll go by position as well. So we'll start, of course, with the Ferrari team who bounced back big time this season. Of course, in 2020, they finished in P6. This season, they finished in P3. We're in a close fight for the first 75-80% of the season with McLaren for third place. Here, McLaren, who we'll get onto in a moment, were very good this season as well. But Ferrari, through development really only of their power unit, were able to eventually get ahead of McLaren and clearly stay ahead. Uh, Ferrari definitely towards the end of the season having the quicker car. We look at it through the season. Um, at the start of the season, it was... I would say kind of equal between the two teams and it was looking very close. Of course, Ferrari had pole position in Monaco and Baku. Uh, didn't capitalise on both of them, even though Baku, I don't think they would have been able to capitalise on anyway because they didn't really have the race pace to, you know, to get pole, uh, sorry, to get the race win there with Charles Leclerc to convert that pole position. Um, but yeah, during the season, during the mid part of the season, and when we came to the Italian Grand Prix, for example, it looked as though McLaren were going to beat them to third, really because despite Ferrari, aerodynamically speaking, had a car that was better um, and was definitely able at times around certain circuits to compete with the likes of Mercedes and Red Bull, Ferrari was still lacking the power that McLaren had, but with a, another upgrade to the power unit around the Russian Grand Prix, I believe... Um, for the Ferrari team, that is the moment that really clinched them third place in the constructions. Of course, the power unit, the new one they introduced in view to next season. Uh, next season, of course, they want to be a season where they um, get back to the top of the mountain that is Formula One. But yeah, really, the development of the power unit and having a good aerodynamic base is the reason Ferrari are finishing third place. So congratulations to them. Good to see them bounce back. Uh, next season, I think they have to be in the title fight because given how they have not really developed the aerodynamic package of their car for about a year and a half now, that much, and have focused a lot on 2022, if they next season are still a midfield team, then they're going to have to blow the whole thing up in terms of team personnel because that is just not good enough. And Bonotto will, of course, have to be the first one to go if that is the case. So hopefully next season, Ferrari are title contenders. I will also add, though, that despite them finishing third, I still think this team has hallmarks of 2019 and 2020 in them. For example, Monaco should have been a race win, but Leclerc crashing into the barriers and end of qualifying, and then Ferrari not checking both sides of the car when, uh, you know, put the car back together, led, of course, to him not um, doing the Grand Prix because he actually still had a problem resulting from that crash. So, yeah, really disappointing moment there. And Silverstone, they should have won that. But, again, tripped over themselves, tripped over their own dicks. Um, power unit problem, the reason behind that. Uh, thankfully, they didn't retire from that race. But, like I said, they should have won that race as well. So they have still got that circus act you know, part of their act, but it didn't affect them enough this season to uh, finish lower than third. But they've still got some um, some parts of their team that, yeah, I think will cost them in a championship fight. And I think if they are in the championship fight next season, I still think, as long as Bonotto is team principal, I still think they will not win a championship until... He is not in that role because I just don't think he could run the team well enough and, you know, in a way that doesn't make mistakes all the time in that type of high-pressure environment of competing for a championship. I just don't think he could do the job uh, to win a championship unless they build a car that is, you know, miles quicker than the uh, rest of the field. But in regards to Ferrari finishing in third, I do need to show this quick... Uh, graphic that really does illustrate that since that new power unit was took on, how much Ferrari, you know, um, outperformed McLaren and really how Ferrari dominated McLaren in the second half of the season and how that power unit contributed to so many good results. So you can see here, this is the final eight Grand Prix of the season. And then in Russia, despite some grid penalties, I think for Charles Leclerc, 
Uh, they scored still 15 points. Of course, Carlos Sainz, he started on the front row. McLaren still scored 19 uh, with Norris and Ricardo. I think Ricardo finished in... Was it fourth Ricardo finished in? And then Norris finished up in, I think, sixth place for the McLaren team. And then Turkey, Mc, uh, um, yeah, McLaren, only six points, quite poor. Daniel Ricciardo especially was poor in that Grand Prix. Uh, Ferrari, 16 points. Charles Leclerc, very close as well to a podium in that Grand Prix. Probably should have got a podium because his pace was very, very good that weekend. Then at the American Grand Prix, Ferrari had a strong result. McLaren also, but not as strong as Ferrari. And then in Mexico, Brazil and Qatar, McLaren, very poor showing. Only two points from the Mexican and Brazilian Grand Prix, or sorry, Sao Paulo Grand Prix. And then in Qatar, only two points. And of course, unreliability, um, a crash at turn one in Mexico and a tyre problem in Qatar is the reason why McLaren um, scored so, uh, such poorly, uh, so, you know, so low points-wise, is the thing I was trying to say, um, in those three races. Ferrari, you can see, though, in those three races, they ended up actually scoring a combined 46 points. So those were really the three races that won Ferrari this battle. In Saudi, McLaren would outscore them by a point, but in Abu Dhabi, it would be 16 points to six in favour of Ferrari but I think Ferrari do overall deserve to finish third because like I said I think they had the better aerodynamic and chassis uh, package and I think a uh, better driver lineup and I just think had a better season than McLaren. McLaren though they still had a good season. Um, McLaren you know got their first race win in nine years. They had also what was it two other podium finishes Probably should have won the Russian Grand Prix as well. So, you know, could have easily had two race wins this season. But, like I said, won their first race in nine years. Also a 1-2 finish. The only 1-2 finish by any team this season. And their first 1-2 since uh, 2012, I think. I think 2012 they had a 1-2 finish, didn't they? Just trying to think if they did have one in 2012. Um, not sure... Maybe it wasn't 2012. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was 2010, their last one two. I think the Canadian Grand Prix of 2010 was the last one two finish. But yeah, still a very good season. But most of the season, they were in third place. Lando Norris as well. What a season he had. It's a shame he didn't finish in the top five in the championship because honestly, he does deserve, I think, to finish in the top five of the championship. I know Carlos Sainz has had a good season, but Lando in the first half of the season was absolutely amazing the amount of top five finishes he had in the races he had also a podium at Imola and a podium in the second race of Austria could have had a podium at Silverstone um finished what fourth in Bahrain uh where else um Baku could have arguably had a podium there so yeah what a season by him Daniel Ricciardo didn't have that great of a season, despite the win. He had some good races, some good results, but overall, Daniel Ricciardo did not have a good season, and he has to improve next season and be, even if he is still slower and not as good as uh, Land uh, Lando Norris, has to be a lot closer because there were races where Lando was, you know, 30 or 40 seconds ahead in certain races and even lapping, I think, Ricciardo a couple times in certain races. So, yeah, just simply... Not good enough on his part, but at least he got another race win. A brilliant weekend it was from him at uh, Monza, where he drove just superbly and got the absolute best out of the McLaren car. He did improve as well, Ricardo, as the season went on, but I think really the two biggest reasons why McLaren didn't finish third, one, Ferrari outdeveloped them. Um, even though their only development really was on the power unit side, they did technically outdevelop them. And also Daniel Ricciardo's lack of performance. If Ricciardo was performing to the level of Lando Norris, I think McLaren definitely would have finished third in the championship because Ric <coughs> sorry, Ricciardo in the first half of the season probably would have got his podiums as well, not just Ricciardo. So Ricciardo definitely has to improve, not just for his sake, but for the team's sake because they could have got definitely third in the championship, despite Ferrari performing so well at the end of the season, um, you know, because Ricardo and McLaren, um, McLaren especially, were much better in the first half of the season. But like I said, 
still a good season. And I think next season, if they make that next step on the car and can match, you know, Red Bull and Mercedes pace wise, they've got a good enough driver lineup. They've got a good enough team operationally at the circuit. Uh, they don't really make that many mistakes to McLaren. And you can see in the last couple of years, they've really improved compared to what they were like in 2017 and 2018. This team is really only one step away from being title contenders. I really think that. If they just make that step from midfield to front-running team, then I think without a doubt next season, they will be title contenders. Hopefully with Ferrari, and then we'll get a, a four-way title fight with obviously Red Bull Mercedes as well. But you never know. What's going to happen in that regard? Um, Alpine, next up, they finished, of course, fifth in the Constructors' Championship. When you look at who their main battle was this season, which was Aston Martin and Alpha Tauri, I mean, yeah, good in that regard. But coming into the season, I think everyone expected, and even they expected, that it would be better than fifth place in the Constructors. They did end the season well, but overall, it was not a good season, in my opinion. This team, you know, they've got, you know, obviously Renault backing because they were the Renault Works team last season. They're, you know, they've got the resources, def you know, definitely compared to Alpha Tauri and Aston Martin um, to be, I think, definitely way more competitive than them. And even though Esteban Ocon, as you just saw there, got the race win, Fernando Alonso got a podium um, in Qatar. Great to see Fernando, by the way, back on the podium in Formula 1 for the first time since 2014. I think Alpine were capable of a lot more. Their driver lineup, I thought, were performance-wise this season. I thought they did really well. And like I said, there were races where Alpine had some good ones. And if the car was just that bit better, you know, two or three tenths of a second quicker this season, I think Alpine could have finished third. I really think that because, like I said, the driver lineup was good enough and they had... You know, certain races where they were really good, despite not being, say, as quick as other teams in the midfield pack. Uh, they weren't as quick as Alpha Tari this season, for example. They absolutely were not. Alpha Tari were, I think, the better team, and that's why Alpha Tari should be definitely disappointed that they finished um, behind Alpine. But this team, they are just the perennial underachievers in Formula One. They really are. They they have a lot more potential than they than they show. Because we've seen, again, this season, race win for Ocon. I know it was in a bit of a, a lucky circumstance, but the pace from Ocon still, for the rest of the race, was really good. And like I said, Alonso in Qatar, uh, we saw how they were in the final race. Their pace was pretty good. Um, could have got a podium as well in the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. They, they, they've had some very good races this season. The pace has been good from them. And when they've got it right, they've had some you know very good results. But like I said, they just do not show that potential enough. They have way more unrealized potential than I think a lot of people out there realize. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to the fact that their, you know, the gains they thought they made in the wind tunnel did not translate onto circuit. I mean, they started the season, for example, way, way off the pace of McLaren and Ferrari. They did close that gap in the second half of the season, but just not good enough. And I think Alpine. Next season, if they, with the new regulations, if they don't really make a sizable move up the grid, um, at least pace-wise, if they don't close the gap to the people ahead of them on pace, then Alpine are just going to be a midfield team from now on. And like I said, that is them not performing anywhere near to the potential that they do have. For Alpha Tauri, I think Alpha Tauri have had a disappointing season in terms of the result of the end of the season where Alpha Tauri have finished sixth in the constructors. Yes, it is a gain on what they had um, in 2020, but Alpha Tauri, pace wise, were the fifth quickest team this season. Gasly, so many times, you had a great season, by the way. So many times, Pierre ended up finishing in the top six in qualifying. Of course, had only one podium. Um, in Baku, maybe could have had more if he was a bit luckier in certain circumstances. But yeah, great. I honestly, I think he had a great season, Pierre. And Alpha Tari, again, pace-wise, they were very, very good. But so many times they failed to deliver on that promise, whether it be a driver mistake by Gasly or Sonoda, um, getting unlucky, 
or you know problem with the car an accident whatever it may be they just could not put together a consistent run of you know good points finishes they just couldn't do it and with alpine getting the big results they did that's what led alpine of course to finishing fifth in the constructors um i still think alpha tauri you know the car they produced this season i think was was a pretty good one probably the best alpha tauri or toro rosso whatever you want to call it car they've they've had i thought they were you know very competitive this season but i still think there was more there for the alpha tauri team and again lost out on that elusive top five finish uh next season though i think they'll probably be around the same place on the grid and if they were to still with gasly be you know consistently getting in the top 10 i still think that'd be good enough for them because i think people don't understand how good of an achievement it is for them to be you know fighting like they were consistently with teams like mclaren and ferrari with a driver like pierre gasly so like i said um they are performing well still but i think if you look at this season alone the end result, not good enough, I'm afraid. Braston Martin, without a doubt, the most underperforming team of the season and the biggest disappointment of 2021, without a doubt, is Aston Martin. Maybe you could put Daniel Ricciardo up there as the biggest disappointment, but Daniel did win a race. I know this team had a podium in Baku with Sebastian Vettel, and there were a few races where they had a good, um, a good result, but considering last season they were really the third quickest team and they probably should have finished third in the driver's championship uh so not the driver's championship the constructor's championship for them to drop to seventh and be uh, as well for a few races this season way off the pace of the mclarens ferraris and even now Al even alpha tauris at times or even alpine at times this season just not good enough um of course the disqualification in hungary really affected them in terms of could they fight alpine and alpha tauri because it took so many points away from them that they did gain that they weren't able then to fight um any high, uh, fight for any position higher than p7 but yeah very disappointing season despite that though because of now the the you know much more money they have and the extra resources they have now that they're aston martin and given the people they're signing from other teams such as mercedes and red bull even though certain uh, people they have signed won't be starting until midway through 2022 or even at the start of 2023 i still think this team is going to be a good team in the next new era starting in of course next year in 2022 they've always been a team that despite this season they've always been a team that has performed better than their budget has allowed them to so i still think this team will be a a force maybe not next year but you know the year or two after that i think aston martin will be a team to look out for um i think really the reason they finished seventh in the constructors is because like mercedes they got caught out by the new regulations regarding the floor and of course aston martin slash racing point from last season uh there were let's put it this way <laughs> similarities between the two cars and um it also negatively affected them as well as mercedes so you know that's what you get for copying and that's why you shouldn't copy guys um in certain instances because if the other person you're copying is getting it wrong you'll also be wrong next up williams eighth in the constructors a good season considering how uh, their car is pace wise compared to the rest of the field i mean it is still a pretty slow car let's be honest and uh, williams still should be better than what they were um this season but yeah williams I think considering how tough the last two or three years has been, you know, finishing at the back of the grid and being a, a running joke, really, in Formula One and in the F1 community, I think this was a good step forward. Russell, great season. I mean, I can't even remember the amount of times he got into Q2 and even sometimes got into Q3. He was that good. And um, the highlight of his season, of course, will be the second place at Spa. Um, that he got in qualifying and of course translated into the race because there was no race at Spa. Also another highlight for him will be the eighth place in Friday qualifying at Silverstone. That was an absolute stunner. Uh, but the Hungarian Grand Prix, wow, what a relief that was for them. Getting eighth and ninth, Latifi in eighth and Russell in ninth. That really set them off for the season. 
uh, because they were fighting so hard and for so long for a points finish. And finally, they got it with, I think, was it six points in the end? And then, of course, uh, Russell got a load of points at Spa that essentially guaranteed they would finish in um, eighth place. I think Russell also scored points at Monza as well. So good job by him. Also, Nicholas Latifi, I think, he does deserve to be in Formula 1. There's no doubt about it. Um, he has, even at a couple times at the end of this season, has, has out-qualified Russell. Plenty of times, though, even though Russell has out-qualified him, say, in Q1, Latifi's been knocked out and Russell's got through. Latifi's not been that far behind on lap time. So I think Latifi, you know, respect needs to be shown to him, honestly. And if Albon comes in next season and definitely showcases what I believe he is, which is not as quick as Russell, and Latifi keeps up what he was doing, Latifi could be the number one at Williams next season. He could. He really, really could. Hopefully Williams next season, you know, with them able to have more wind tunnel time because they're lower in the championship, hopefully they've used that well in the last few months to produce a good car for 2022. Obviously sad that Frank Williams passed. Um, yeah, very, very sad. Of course, last year was the end of an era with Williams selling the team to, is it Doriton or Doriloton Capital? I can't remember the exact name of the company running it now. But yeah, such a shame. He lived a great life, though. Um, you know, being disabled for so long and still leading the team, still winning championships as a, you know, disabled, physically disabled person. And of course, the job he did to build that team and build them firstly into a race winning and championship winning outfit before um, the car accident in 1986. Just absolutely fantastic what he did. Obviously, what his daughter did, not so much. Um, I think she definitely contributed a lot to the downfall of the team. But Frank Williams, probably the... I mean, I think maybe me and Nib did a stream on this once about, you know, who is the greatest team boss of all time. But now I think of it, I'd probably say Frank Williams was the greatest team boss of all time because... You know, if you look at, say, Jean Tot, um, Ross Braun, uh, who else? Ron Dennis. They had a lot. I mean, maybe not Ross Braun, considering the circumstances behind 2009. So maybe, you know, throw him out of the equation because he doesn't have as many championships to his name as a team boss that, say, Ron Dennis and Jean Tot and Frank Williams has. So, yeah, throw him out of the equation. But compared to Ron Dennis and, and Jean Tot, even though they had a difficult job to overturn those two teams, uh, Dennis with McLaren and Jean Tot with Ferrari, they had a lot more money and resources at their disposal than what Frank had. Frank literally you know, had to start the team and build it up from scratch in terms of becoming the championship team they become. So I'd probably say, yeah, Frank Williams, despite, I think, decisions he made later on that led to the team being just a midfield team when really they should have stayed at the front of Formula 1. I think Frank Williams, you'd probably have to say, is the greatest team boss of all time. A shame he passed, but even though he has passed, um, you, you still have to say, and you know the disappointment last year of selling the team, you still have to say, considering what happened to him in that car crash, the life he had, still, still very good, I think. Uh, next up, Alfa Romeo, very disappointing season. Fred Vassar, the team boss, even said during the last weekend that even though they made a step forward on the car, which I think you did see in the final few races, they didn't really go anywhere with it. So many times, Alfa Romeo looked as though they had the pace, especially at the start of the season, looked as though they had the pace to uh, you know, be in the top 10 a few times in, in, in the Grand Prix, but just failed to deliver so many times. Qualifying, they were dead slow so many times. And honestly, if next year they're not really that much better, then I think they're going to have to salber, you know, that part of the team. They're going to have to go a different way um, with, you know, the way they're going with their team. Because this Alfa Romeo deal, up to this point, it hasn't worked out. Yeah, they have kept the team alive, but it's not really worked out. And they've got to go a different way, I think, if it doesn't really improve next season because they have been really since the second half of 2019 they've been a back marker and that's not where we want to see them be and of course with the driver lineup they have next season of Valtteri Bottas and Guan Yu Zhou 
they need to be better. Uh, sadly, of course, Kimi Raikkonen goes off into the distance, but thankfully he doesn't have to endure this car anymore. And of course, Antonio Giovinazzi is heading for Mario Kart. We'll see what he can do in that series. And finally is the joke of Formula 1, the Haas F1 team, the meme team. Um, yeah, what an absolute shit show from this team. Absolute utter shit is, is what this team is. Yes, of course, they didn't develop the car, but they were an absolute joke this season. If they weren't on the grid, I don't think anyone would have noticed, to be honest. Um, Nikita Mazepin, worst driver probably in this century in Formula 1. Maybe not of all time, but yeah, definitely the worst driver that I've ever seen since I started watching Formula 1 and I started watching 10 years ago. Just absolutely terrible. Mick Schumacher, the only redeeming light. Hopefully someone can rescue him from this just dreadful situation because even though Haas have concentrated a lot on 2022, I don't see, given how this team is basically a joke um, and has been even in 2019 and 2020, I don't see this team really being a force in the future. If they don't improve next season, really, and are still really at the back of the grid, then honestly, I think they should. I think they should go or you know sell the team to someone else because, well, you know, Gene Haas, of course, should sell the team to someone else because I don't really see at the moment where this team's going. So if next season they don't return to a midfield, a proper midfield outfit, then what's the point? Because given that they don't really build their own car, and they have to rely on other people so much. I don't really see. Like I said, I don't really see where they're going. And the only good season they've had in Formula 1 in 2018 was because they had a year-old Ferrari car with a up-to-date Ferrari power unit. So hopefully they're better next season. I don't think they will be that much better, honestly. Um, and hopefully they're better to the point that we can actually talk about them in, in videos. Because, of course, this season I've not even talked about them because they've been just that bad but that is your review of the midfield a great midfield scrap this season hopefully more of the same in 2022 and there you go guys that is